Hi guys. Hello everyone. Welcome to the TIFF press conference for the film Rampart. I'm Maria Rally, press conference manager. Before we begin, begin, let me just review a few housekeeping items. Uh, we'll get everyone up here in a minute and we'll have about uh, 90 seconds of flash photography. Then we ask you to just move to the back so that we can clear the aisles and the, uh, for uh, microphones for questions. Media, please stand and identify yourself and your name of uh, media outlet before you ask a question. Everybody make sure your cell phones are turned off and the press conference is streamed live at www.tiff.net forward slash festival. And it is now my pleasure to welcome the director and the cast of Rampart as well as our moderator, Eric Kohanic. Thanks. Good afternoon. My name is Eric Kohanek. I'm the moderator for today's press conference for Rampart, a TIFF special presentation that had its premiere at the Princess of Wales Theatre last night. With us today we have, uh, to my right, Director Oren Moverman. Next to Oren, we have Brie Larson, who plays the role of Helen, one of the daughters in the movie. Next to Brie, we have uh, Woody Harrelson, who takes on the main role of date rape Dave Brown, <laughs> the renegade cop who's struggling to overcome uh, his own flaws. We, we call him just Dave Brown. <laughs> Next to Woody, we have uh, Robin Wright, who plays the role of Linda Fentress in the film. Next to Robin, we have Sammy Boyarski, who plays uh, Dave Brown's daughter, Margaret. And last but certainly not least, Ben Foster, who takes on the role of Terry. I'm just gonna open this up, um, Oren. Last night at the uh, Q&A after the premiere, you had a lot of praise for James Elroy. I wonder if you can expand upon that. Uh, no, that was my limit. <laughs> Uh, <laughs> and, and talk about, a bit about the genesis of this project and, and how it came about. Well, it all came from you know, the mind of James Elroy. He wrote the original script. He created these characters, uh, the character of Date Rape, Dave Brown, primarily. Very complicated and uh, contradictory character. And I was, um, it's always difficult to say exactly what my role was because I was brought in initially to to work with the script. He wrote a huge script, a gigantic script, uh, sprawling, long, complicated, that had to be streamlined, and that was really my job initially. And my goal was to out, out Elroy, Elroy. I was going to write like him, just make it as much fun as he did. And then they offered the script to me, and then I started you know, taking it apart um, as a director and worked on subsequent drafts, um, which is you know, ultimately the film that was made. Great. If you have any questions I meant to mention, please pop up your hands. We have people with microphones. We'll bring them over to you. Feel free to identify yourself and your affiliation. Uh, you asked a question. Just throw over to you, uh, Woody. Um, last night as well, you had a lot of praise for Oren and for Ben in the post-screening uh, Q&A. Um, obviously, you guys all work fantastically together. I uh, wonder if you could talk a little more about the experience of working with them on this. Well, it's, uh, I suppose, every actor's dream to get thrown into this kind of uh, group that, uh, you know, to be working with a director like Orrin and uh, also with Ben as not just a, a great actor uh, who transforms in this role, but also as a tremendous producer who is there every day helping, especially with emotional scenes. He was incredibly supportive just like uh, 
with the messenger. But, uh, you know, I love these guys. They're, they're like my brothers, so to get to go on another journey with them so soon after the other one was unexpected and delightful and fraught with peril and uh, difficulty, but also uh, just a dream, dream job. Or in, uh, in, uh, maybe you can expand a bit more about your cast. It's certainly a star-filled cast. Talk a bit about getting all these people together and, and well, it's very simple. I, I don't think of it as a star-filled cast. It's a, it's a, a cast of really, really, really good actors, and uh, that was the goal. It, it really didn't matter um, because we were, you know, we were not going, uh, we were not playing the name game. We we're not trying to get the movie financed based on any um, sort of secretive numerical combination um, that has to do with names. We we're just going for every role for the right actor. And the right actor not, not necessarily being sort of, this is how it's written, so we gotta find the person who is exactly that. Every uh, actor in the movie has an opportunity to create the character uh, and to, to bring you sort of what, what, what they are interested in, who they are to, to the character and transform the character so that my job becomes very, very easy. We have a question in the audience. Hi, my name is uh, Ed Simkus, Gatehouse Media. Woody. A question for you about how you approach this. Uh, when you come to a project like this, do you walk in with a plan or do you do it kind of organically while you're there and it's growing? Uh, you mean the approach to the character? To the character, how are you going to play it? Um, well, you know, I thought the script really gave a lot of clues and then along the way, uh, you know, hanging out with cops and talking a lot with uh, Orn about backstory and he, he he did that also with the messenger you know gave a lot of help with backstory that's not in the script at all and uh, you know coupled with like hanging out with cops and just getting into a, a cop mentality which is a men mentality I I thought was kind of a hard thing to take on because I just can't hardly see myself as a cop I mean I can now but at the you know before it, it seemed hard to imagine um, but you know it is a nice water to swim in because it was an, it just was an exciting plunge L all kinds of stuff that we got to see in driving around with these guys that you really aren't going to get to see you know <laughs> unless you have an opportunity like this a question in the back yes hi uh, Kerry Roberts from filmography on movie central my question is for Orrin I too am a big fan of James Elroy and I also read a really good book called A Bright and Guilty Place, and this really detailed the sordid history of the LAPD. My question to you is, how comfortable is Los Angeles with its history of police corruption, and did you run into any roadblocks with the LAPD on this film? Uh, no, actually, we didn't, we didn't have any resistance from the LAPD. I, I don't think I heard the first part of the question, but I'll answer the question that I have in my mind. Um, we. You know, we had a lot of help, um, technical support from the LAPD. I actually got to meet with Bernard Parks, who was the chief of police uh, during the Rampart scandal. Uh, I think a lot has changed, a lot has not. Um, I think there are a lot of different um, sort of cops who weren't around back then, um, so they were very sort of comfortable with it, but also not even, it seemed like sometimes not even aware of it, because um, it, it, you know, 1999 was so long ago. Um, we, I'm, I'm curious when, you know, the movie is not about the scandal. The scandal is the backdrop. Uh, it's really a journey with one man going into sort of his interior life and sort of trying to see what are the consequences of the sins of the past, which is the, the typical, um, sort of stereotypical behavior of the LAPD. So I'm, I'm curious to see what, you know, how cops will react to it from the LAPD when they see it. I, I got a sense on set sometimes when Woody would do certain things uh, that um, they were very enjoyable to the cops who were there just as a, as a piece of fiction to watch. But, you know, I wouldn't know how to guess about how real it was for them in a personal way. I got a f little bit of a feeling. Ben, I wonder if you can chime in uh, going back to uh, Woody talking about working with you. How was it from your side of things getting together with Woody and Orrin again for this film? The experience of the messenger was a was a, 
we, we wanted to make another movie together. And uh, any excuse to spend time with uh, people you love and respect, uh, making a film is a, is a pretty good excuse. Um, sorry. Question down here in the front. <laughs> Grab the microphone. Um, I've met James Alroy, and he seems like a guy with a, a big heart, at least he did to me. And I thought, I wondered, is, it is this purely a cop's movie? Is there anything romantic in it? And why didn't he come? What was the last part? Why didn't he come to the film festival? Oh, he, he didn't come to the film festival because he had a schedule uh, conflict. He was actually being honored by the LAPD last night. <laughs> so, um, uh, you know, so you know where, where he's coming from. Um, James, uh, w w what's the actual question? It's it's have you seen the movie? No. Oh, okay. Um, it's not to me. Obviously, it's it's a it's a film that's in the world of a genre, LAPD cop movie. But uh, it's not a to me. It's not about just a cop. It, to me, it's about a man who goes through, um, through life in a certain way and he refuses to change at a time of great change to, um, you know, to the police department. And I think it's about following um, his sort of demise in the sense that everything that he's done, everything that he's applied to the way he defines himself as a man is falling apart. And to me, that's an emotional journey. That's, a, that's a, an existential journey of, of a stripping of all the pretense and all the behavior and all the acting and all the performance that comes with being a man, a certain kind of man, um, it all goes away. At the end, you're just left with, with a reflection of a human being who you know, has a very sort of ambiguous uh, future, but uh, has come to realize what his past was. And uh, that could be about cops, that could be about soldiers, that could be about mailmen, that could be about anyone. Um, that's what was interesting to me about it. One of his many lovers. Can you expand on, what, on that? Not really. Robin, no, um, I can't. Um, <laughs> you know, talk a bit, bit more about Linda and, and the attraction and repulsion that she feels for uh, Dave. Um, she's probably the most dysfunctional woman that he sleeps with, and therefore they're a beautiful match. I think they found each other's primal mate, and they're alone without each other because of that. And how long did it take for you guys to develop that sort of chemistry to, to show that on screen? About 10 shots of Patron, <laughs> I think, is what it was. <laughs> I don't know what she's talking about. I'm a professional, <laughs> and I would never drink while on the job. And for that. insurance purposes, that, that was a joke. <laughs> I have a question over here. Uh, Jeff Hodgson, Reuters. Question for Woody. Uh, there's already been a lot of early, pra it's early days, but there's been a lot of praise for your, um, your performance. Uh, I guess a, a lot of talk about Oscar buzz. I, you've been nominated before, but how do you feel about that prospect uh, some people are talking about? Um, it's always nice to get an invite to the party, uh, <laughs> but we can't uh, count on those things. And I don't know. I, you know, anytime you're uh, working on a movie with Orrin Moberman, there's definitely those possibilities because he does shoot for the stars. He goes for the big, you know, he, he's not going to do any schlock picture ever, you know, so. Uh, but I don't, I, I can't really think about those things. On the other hand, I can't think about anything else, so. <laughs> Catch 22. We'll throw one in here for Bree. Uh, can you talk a bit about Helen and your approach to that character? She goes through a lot of emotional turmoil uh, in the film. <laughs> and you, you mentioned last night how hard it was to, to do all that crying and then watch it a year later with a room full of strangers. I, I did say that. <laughs> um, yeah, the word, uh, people say that it's difficult. I don't think that it's difficult to do that's actually the strange thing about it is there's something there's something about this part and the way that I approach it and my own visceral connection to it and and Woody's connection to this part as well that something happened and we're lucky that 
Oren was there and he created a safe environment for us to explore it and that there happened to be cameras there filming it. But I think it's really wonderful that people have, have seen it as kind of an important um, dynamic, but I don't think that any of us went about it searching for that. And um, it certainly revealed a few things to myself that maybe I didn't want to look at that I'm now looking at. And, and I think that because of that, maybe other people will look at it that way as well. And what about you, Sammy? This is your first movie, major movie role, is that right? Yes. What was, that, what was it like to come Sorry, onto, were, were you very <laughs> familiar with Mr. Harrelson's work, Woody's work, and, and how, how long did- I haven't done any kids' movies. <laughs> how long did it take for you to sort of develop the, the rapport and chemistry that were obvious between uh, Dave and his daughter? Hmm. Well, I don't think it actually took really any time at all because my character, Margaret, was so in love with her dad that it just happened, I guess. Is that what, I don't know. Is, yeah. I'll be quiet now. <laughs> or and maybe you could talk a bit about the uh, visual texture of the movie, the, uh, the style of it. There's a lot of handheld, there's a lot of uh, sensory assault or barrage. Can you talk a bit about structuring the texture of it? Yeah, I mean, we, we were, we were structuring two worlds, basically. Two world, the world, uh, because the character created two worlds for himself. It's the world of his job, where he gets to be the tough guy, where he gets to be part of the American occupation of Los Angeles. To, and, and then the, the world of his family and the quiet, kind of, sort of idyllic world. So we applied different approaches to different scenes. Um, really, the first question that we ask ourselves is, how, how can we be different? There have been a few LAPD movies made over the last hundred years so um, we basically by choosing to go into the character we chose uh, to have a lot of visual reflections of his interiors um, and for us that meant an extreme look to the movie which is super saturated and contrasty and with with uh, sort of an oppressive sun sunlight that um, it's just inescapable and I think that's part of for me, at least as an outsider, that's part of what I feel when I'm in LA, is this kind of oppression of sunlight and that, that only uh, escalates the tension that already exists there, I think, on a, on a human level. And so we, we basically wanted a very colorful film uh, because LA has all these warm colors and all these uh, blocks, blocks of color. When you, you drive around, you see, you know, especially in the Rampart area, you know, red buildings that are completely red, purple, yellow, so we wanted to, you sort of work with those col colors and then have just a, an assault um, because uh, of colors and of, of, of sound and of behavior and uh, because, uh, you know, I, I, f I felt that being a cop in LA, it's, uh, it's a very small police force um, on a, the sort of spread out over a very large population with uh, a lot of problems and a lot of them are vets, ex uh, you know, military guys, and it does feel like, I think, that their philosophy is they're always under assault. They're always um, being defensive. That's why Rampart is not just, you know, the name of the, uh, of the police station in my mind. It's also the defensive sort of embankment that, that they create around them, and that's, that's their behavior, really. That's their state of mind. So Rampart is kind of an attitude, uh, and I think that's kind of visually what the movie is reflective of. And we also wanted to flaunt the fact that we were in L.A. We were going to use L.A. as much as possible. So we shot at the Pacific Dining Car and uh, Tommy's Burgers and City Hall and places that are familiar and made sure that everybody sees the palm trees and, and know that we shot in L.A. and we're, uh, we're proud of that. Woody, how, how aware were you of what, what the visual texture was going to be as you were doing the scenes? Did, did you watch the dailies and, and begin to get a sense of the style of the film? No, I, I didn't have that sense. I mean, I knew the, the, uh, Oren and Bobby Bukowski are really a dream team, and I knew that they were coming up with incredible shots, but no, it was all, I had no idea until I watched it. I think it's really beautiful. And, and how physically grueling was some of the stuff that you had to do? Physically grueling? Yeah. Um, well, I did lose weight. Yeah, that was hard. <laughs> 30 pounds? 
Yeah, tw 29 pounds, I think it was. Yeah. You've had a lot of film roles, and like you said, there were no kids' movies among them, but uh, a lot of actors today, TV actors, are making the transition to movies. How difficult was that for you back when you were making the transition from a mainstream TV comedy to some of the things you've done now? Can you talk a bit about the evolution of your career that way? Well, I mean, I think it's hard because people start to think of you in a certain light and it's so basically the the uh, difficulty is in trying to convince one director to believe that you can do something else and uh, you know once that happened the you know doors open to doing movies and was there uh, one role that sort of really blew the doors open that sort of probably white men can't jump yeah <coughs> okay, we we'll have a question. Uh, hi, my name is uh, my name is Vanya Bellinger, Bulgarian newspaper Dnevnik, and this question goes to uh, Ben Foster and Woody Harrelson. Um, you played in the Messenger uh, U.S. soldiers, and you showed how is the human price of the wars of, of decades of wars, and today is 9/11. Uh, so I wanted to hear your take. Um, when you wake up this morning and you realize it's 9-11, what were your thoughts about it? Well, it'd be nice if there were an adequate investigation done. That's my thought. Pretty well, right? Is there another question? Yes, down here in the front. Hi folks, Andrea Case, CTV News. We know you've worked with Oren before. What is it about him that you believe in so that you take another trip with him making this film? And also for the other uh, actors on stage, what is it about Oren that made you want to make this film? Gosh, well, yeah, I mean, it, it's hard to, it, it's hard to, when you work with Orrin, it, it almost becomes a cult. You know, I, I moved from Los Angeles uh, to New York to work with him after working on The Messenger. Uh, his approach is it's truly unusual and rare. Uh, he loves people, and uh, he's not a director who, who wants to uh, nail it or make it perfect. It's about finding something. And uh, he's always seeking these beautiful, clumsy human moments that that we always try to uh, forget about, but keeps us awake at night when we're alone. Those moments that we all have, reviewing the day, he's after that. Uh, and creates an environment that, that allows uh, actors to, to listen. Uh, the, there's, there's no room to, to act at each other. It's, 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 it's a creating an environment of listening and pursuit. So the one problem or, or uh, the, the difficult thing about working with Oren is that um, you have to pay the bills and he gets spoiled after working with him. Um, I love the fact about Oren that he, again, like just lets you, if, if you know the character, huh, okay, I'm starting over. <laughs> um, if you know the character well enough, you'll be able to show how you know them in a way. Like, with we were able to do improv on some of the scenes, and it was able to show how much you know the character, and to um, to have a director trust you so much to let you do that. Robin, you have any thoughts on that? Going in a row. Well. Sorry. Um, the rehearsal for my memorial. <laughs> but it's your lifetime achievement. You've achieved it. We were talking about this craft that we do is such a, it's a game. And it reminds me, we're working with Orange like red light, green light, because you are the light. So you can't see what's behind you. You don't know what's moving. And it's like he sets that stage for you where he says, you know there's a light, you know there's green, yellow, red. 
I'm not going to tell you when to go to yellow, when to go to green, and when to stop. But just know that the light's there and the intersection's there. And I'm going to turn my back, and I want you to throw the color at me. And then I'll change the light. That was the visual that I always had, because somebody was talking about this in an interview. You know, what is it that you do? And I said, it's a game. It is like a board game or musical chairs. or We're playing together, but there's so much mystery with such an incredible foundation. And that kind of dichotomy, you can fail. And beautiful things come out of failure, you know? Anybody else want to weigh in on that? I would have to follow that. Um, yeah, geez, that was well stated. But I, I think, um, you know, I ran into Milos Forman for years. Uh, people would say, what was your favorite movie? Or, movie you feel like's the best, and I would say People versus Larry Flint. But anyway, I ran into Milos Forman in New York, and he, he had just seen The Messenger, and he says, now you won't be able to say that Larry Flint is your best film. <laughs> and uh, it's pretty high praise coming from one of the great uh, filmmakers of all time, but I think it's deserved because I think Warren, you know, <coughs> He's just born to it. He he was meant to be a director. He's you you need to feel completely safe, like you're with someone who's like a papa bear who's just taking care of you and nurturing you and sets the stage and all the elements and and the excitement and the danger of the scene is all there for you to jump in and yet you feel completely safe. Maybe a little bit nervous, but completely <laughs> safe because you got Oren at the helm and you know that he's going to make it not only is it going to be acceptable, it's going to be beautiful in the end. So it's a, it's a privilege to work with Oren. I think he is a truly great director and the sky's the limit for him. <clears throat> but he certainly knows what he wants and, and he has his own unique vision and it's extraordinary. So many great things have already been said. Um, I guess, I guess for me, um, I I went deeper than I have within myself and exposed myself in a way that uh, to myself and also to others. And for someone who's uh, very fearful of large groups of people, it says a lot. And I know within myself that the only way that I was able to do it was because I know that Oren gives the best hugs I've ever received in my entire life. And I've cried into him. And it was the most satisfying cry I've had in a long time. And it was not just because of the scene, but because I was given satisfaction. And, and it was because I knew he was there, but ultimately the decisions were my own. Great. We ha only have time for a couple more questions, so we'll go over here. Just a quick one in two parts. Uh, for Woody Harrelson, uh, Reuter, Jeff Hutchinson with Reuters again. There's been a lot of uh, role, memorable roles of corrupt police officers. Uh, Denzel Washington won an Oscar for one, Harvey Keitel, Richard Gere. A qu question, first one, were you a bit intimidated by, you know, when, with those performances already having been done? And two, how did you kind of make the performance your own? What was the second part? How did you, how did you go about making the performance your own? Oh. Well, I played it, so that <laughs> the second part's easy. Uh, the first part, I didn't really, um, you know, try to stack myself up against Harvey Keitel or any of these other performances. I, if I were to think that way, I'd be, I'd shoot myself in the foot before I got out of the gate because, I mean, those are amazing performances. But uh, to me, it was just about coming to believe that I could be a cop. It, that was my hardest thing, and I, you know, driving around with these guys <coughs> in uh, L.A. really helped me to believe, oh, you know, it's possible. And then to jump into the ring with these people, you know, it's like they make it all much more believable, much more, uh, you know, the texture of the scene is... Uh, well, wow, these are great actors, so. But Woody is, is so humble about these things. He's one of the most thorough actors. He's a, he's a, he's a national treasure. 
and the amount of work that he did, he, he says, I lost 29 pounds. Uh, that's just weight. You, you see a man who willingly uh, loses his fucking marbles on screen, and, um, and, and he went there, and, uh, and he continues to go there. He, he's one of the finest actors we have, and uh, to compare him to anyone else would be uh, ridiculous and embarrassing. All right, then. On that note, I love you. there are no more questions. Thank you all for coming. Thank you for being here. Thank you. How many are in the next one? <laughs>